2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6. How many um, know that the Old Testament has some good things for us? Yeah, some people are afraid of the Old Testament. They like to just sit in the New Testament where they feel everything is much more easier. But the Old Testament has some hidden nuggets. Today we're going to look at an axe head, a stick, and the impossible. Do you believe that God can do the impossible? All right, very good. Let's start with reading. Now the sons of the prophet said to Elisha, see the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan and each of us get there a log and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And he answered, go. Then one of them said, be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was felling a log, his axe head head fell into the water, and he cried out, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. And then the man of God said, Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in, and there and made the iron float. And he said, take it up. And so he reached out his hand and he took it. Turn with me to Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54, that means you have to make a right hand turn in your Bible. Isaiah 54, go down a few streets. Verse 2, when you reach it. Isaiah 54, verse 2, if you're looking up at me, that means you reached it, or maybe you're just a good listener. And it says this, enlarge the place of your tent, and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords, and strengthen your stakes. Father God, we just commit the scriptures to you. We pray, Father God, that you would open the eyes of our understanding, that the illumination of your word would stand out. Lord, you see every individual that you have brought here today, and you have come to speak to them. They've sung out, would you meet me here today? So God, I am believing that in your word, you are here to meet with your children. You are here to speak directly into their hearts. And you are here to cause the axe heads within their lives to arise and float in the name of Jesus. So God, we bind every distraction that the enemy would want to bring into this place that would want to uh, exalt itself above you. And we declare that you will be exalted above every distraction because it is bound in the name of Jesus. Your word will go forth in power and might. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have Bible college students. If you're in college or in university, you know what it means to be a student. That means you have professors. That means you have teachers. That means somebody is over you. All right, and so we have these students that have gathered uh, in their school and in their classroom, and they are studying the word. They're studying under the prophet Elisha. They are alluded in the scripture as being sons of the prophet. But they find that they're in cramped spaces. They find that the place that they're in has no more room for them. And they're saying to themselves, I I can't study, I can't focus, there's too much distraction because your elbow keeps nudging me, I don't know. But I'm just cramped in my space. And they decide to go to the prophet Elisha and they say to him, the place in which we are dwelling is too small for us. And I could just imagine Elisha going, "Mm mm-hmm, yeah, I'm glad you noticed. I knew this, after all, he's a prophet. I, I knew you were going to come to me about this, but he, he's listening to them, and he's, they says, let us go and build a place. And he's like, okay, well, go. 
The American Standard Version says, the place we are at, the place we are in, is too limited. Are you in a place that is limiting you today? Or have you put yourself in a place where you have limited yourself? The place we are in is too limited. It's causing us to not feel as though we could do all that we could do. You know there's more within you. You know you have more to offer. But the place in which you're in is holding you captive. It's not allowing you to stretch yourself out. It's not allowing you to be all that God has deposited within you to be. You are in a limited space. And you're crying out to God, God, would you use me? God, would you do something with my life? God, would you allow me to be an impact? God, would you allow me to to just have an opportunity to, to experience what it's like to be used of you? Perhaps you're in that place of prayer. Perhaps you're in that place of contemplation within your heart. There's more within me. There's more that I want to do. There's more that I, that I would like to do, but I, I'm held captive. I'm held bound. I'm being limited by my circumstances. I'm being limited by my surroundings. The place that I am in is too small. Or is it perhaps the thinking place that you're in has captured you to be in a small place? Perhaps you're not allowing yourself to see the greater scope, the greater vision that God has for you, the greater capacity that he would like to use you in. And so you're in a small space. You're limited. But something rises up within you. Something becomes a tremor within you. And you're like, the place that I'm in is too small. The place that I'm in is just too small. And you go to God and you say, oh God, the place that I am in is too small. And he's like, yes, it is. It is. God, would, can we go, can we build a place A a bigger place, a a larger place where we could learn more, where more people could come and learn. And he says, go. In the end, it's important to remember we can't become what we need to be by remaining where we are. You can't be who you were designed to be as long as you stay where you are. If you have a dream for something greater, more than likely, you are meant to accomplish that greater. Because God does not deposit dreams into empty banks. He deposits them into a place in which he desires for to enlarge its borders to stretch out its tent pegs, to secure them into the ground, the foundation of his word, and to be used of him. So they appeal to him. The place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan, each of us, and get there a log, and let us make a place for us to dwell there. Go. 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 What's holding you back? Why are you standing here? You want to go? You want to go deeper? You want to grow larger? Go! But we want you to come. Would it please you? Be pleased to go with your servants. Be pleased to go with your servants. Have you ever had an opportunity Let's, let's talk to the men of the house. You have a job opportunity to accept a uh, position at another corporate business, but it may require that you're going to be, you know, traveling a distance, or perhaps your family may have to move so that your traveling is not as long 
And so you go before your family and you're like, hey, you know, I've got this opportunity. Uh, the head office has spoken to me this week. They have another location. They'd like me to go and bring my experience there. It's going to be greater for me. I'll be able to use the, the gifts and talents that I've been offering to this company here. But uh, we're going to be redeveloping this company and bringing it into a new horizon. Uh, but I need to know, will you go with me? Will you, my family, be a part of this new job opportunity? Will you support me? Because some days I might be on the road a little longer, which means I'll be a little less at home. But will you support me in this? Has anybody ever been in a place where they have a vision of which they are called to, but they're looking for someone else to come with them? Would you come? Would you join the vision? Would you be a part of this? This is what I believe God is calling me to, but, but I, I just need some support. I just need some people to be with me that are going to cheer me on. And for these sons of the prophet, it was important that their headmaster would be there because, you see, they realized they had not fully arrived in that place of knowledge, in that place of understanding, and so they were still dependent upon his knowledge. They were still dependent upon his understanding. They wanted to know that if anything went wrong in the building project, they could call upon Elisha and say, hey, what are we to do? We were planning on building over here, but we've hit a roadblock. What do you suggest, O Elisha? They wanted to know that their source of strength, understanding, power was accessible and at hand. And so they said, but please be, be pleased, come with us. It kind of gives a connotation as, they're, as though they're going, come, j j just come. No, 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 but please, please just come. Ever had a kid do that? Mommy, please, please, mommy. Oh, okay, stop with the please, okay? It gives that implication that they're charging him. They're not just going, so Elisha, you want to come with us? They're actually saying, please. They're, they're putting an importance. We saw this with Moses. Did we not in Exodus chapter 33? Do you remember? Exodus 33. Can we turn there? You gotta go left this time. Let's drive through the scriptures, right? <laughs> Exodus 33. 12, Moses said to the Lord, see you say to me, bring this up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me, yet you have said I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore, if I found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight, and consider to this nation is your people... And he said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, don't bring us up from here. The sons of the prophet were in the same place. Elisha, we want to go and we want to build. We want to expand this school. We want to make more opportunities for others to come and learn of, your wor of the word of God. We want to make other opportunities for us to have a greater impact on this community and this place in which we are at. But Elisha, can we go? Can we do this? Go, it's a good idea. But if your presence doesn't go with us, we don't want to go. So they're imploring for his presence. They're seeking for him to be a part of the picture. And so it says that he went. I like Elisha. He's all about the vision. He's all about body ministry. I'm going to be with my peeps. So is that what you guys say? I know. It wasn't cool. It's not what you say. It's okay. Just got to include the kids and the, the, the young people in the service. Then one of them said, be, 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 be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. And so he went with them. And when they came to the place to Jordan, 
Let's stop there for a minute. What's all about Jordan? What's all about Jordan? Can you think of anything that's all about Jordan? Did Moses not cross, or did, did Joshua, after he succeeded over Moses, not take the people and cross over Jordan? Just before facing the walls of Jericho? Did Naaman, not at, the, not, uh, at the charge of Elisha, not have to go dip himself in the waters to experience his healing? What happened in the place of Jordan? Jordan is significant. It's not a big body of water. I've not been to Israel to see it myself, but those of you that have been know it's not a big body of water. Is it not the place where Jesus and John the Baptist had an encounter and Jesus was baptized and there was a declaration, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This body of water may be 200 feet at its deepest was not even the cleanest of waters, but it was Jordan, and some significant things took place. I find it interesting that Elisha would send somebody to dirty water to clean up his act, to get healed. But you see, God doesn't always do what seems natural in the mind and seems to make sense in the mind. He does things that confines the wise, that makes us go, wait a second, this should not be. That's right, because I'm not about doing things your way, I'm about doing things my way, and I'm the God of the impossible, and so I work in the impossible places. So they're going to this place, and they find themselves there, and they begin to build. It's funny, I brought an ax, so last night, there, you know, a lot of cacophony was happening in my house last night, because we're all looking for this ax head. Well, not we all, my son. Because we do have an ax head, but we couldn't find the ax head. So he comes in, he says, Mom, could you use this? I thought, ooh, that kind of looks a little dangerous to be bringing to church. But this represents what they were using in that time. Okay, it's not how it looked then. At that time, it would have been a stone of some sorts of, of iron, excuse me, it would have been iron of some sorts that would have been chiseled and, and sharpened enough to have a sharp edge. And it wouldn't have been attached as we see this one attached. It probably would have been attached like maybe with some leather strips and tied very, very tightly. I promise that this is secure. I really, I really just wanted to bring our other axe head because it was just a little piece, but no, my son's got to find me this thing. The benefits of living where there's country. Do you guys have axe heads in your houses? <laughs> it's embarrassing to admit that I have an axe head, but anyhow, no, more than likely it was uh, tied to the piece of wood by leather, and uh, that leather over aggressive time could have become loose. It would have been necessary for the user of the axe head to make sure that what he was using was securely fastened. But they get to the Jordan and they begin to fall trees. Now I find something really interesting that I had to look up. And it says, so he went down with them and when they came to the Jordan, they cut trees down. But as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water and he cried out, alas, my master, it was borrowed. That might not seem important to you, but in the Old Testament, if a man, according to Deuteronomy 19, if you go to Deuteronomy 19.5, I think it is, if a man was in the forest and he was cutting trees, and should his axe head fall off and hit his neighbor and kill his neighbor, then he had to flee from that place. So I find it interesting that if we didn't know that little piece of information, it would mean nothing to us that he was cutting in the direction of Jordan. He wasn't cutting in the direction of his fellow workers. He was cutting in the direction of Jordan. How do you know that? The scripture doesn't say that either. Because when the access went, 
okay? It landed in the Jordan, which tells me that as he went like this, it went flying that way, not towards his fellow brother and sister. Well, brothers probably more than likely because they were men. And these are heavy. So that ax head flew into the Jordan. The other thing that I'm challenged by, who loans a, a, an ax head that's not fit for work? Like, hello, if you're gonna loan me something, could you loan me something that at least works? Like, don't loan me a hammer that's gonna fall off the first time I use it. Don't loan me an ax head that's gonna go flying into Timbuktu the first time I swing the fell a tree. What was with the individual who loaned this piece of tool? Be careful where you are getting your strength from. Be careful where you are drawing from. Don't go looking for power from some name it and claim it type of personality, but go to the power of the Holy Spirit. Go to the power of God. Don't borrow from God, from men, what you can have freely from God. Don't borrow your power and your cutting edge from man, but borrow it from God. Because then you can be sure it's not going to fly off and break. Then you can be sure that it will be secured and fastened in place. Then you can be sure that when you go to draw upon that power, it will be there for you. And you will not be in fear of who will be hurt around you. Because when God pours out, nothing is broken that he will not repair. So I was challenged by that. I was like, geez. Because I was in a place yesterday where my dishwasher broke down. And so it came up this code. And... Um, so it seems as though it wasn't draining properly, and so I would have to go into the drain. <laughs> okay, it sounds complicated, but it really isn't all that complicated. But I would have to go into the drain and unclog it. So, okay, I am not a plumber. I am not a dishwasher repair woman. But if I have to repair to save us some money, I will. So anyways, I got the, um, you know, those um, shampooers. I thought, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to connect the hose of the shampoo that's meant to extract the water from the carpet. I'm going to connect it to the dishwasher and extract it from the hose. I'm going to suck up whatever is in there blocking that dishwasher, prohibiting it from working the way that it should work. I did that. I was proud of myself, turned on the dishwasher. It went on. I was like, glory be to Jesus. I just saved myself some money. Right? Yeah, few minutes into the cycle, it stopped. That code came back up. And so I was like, hmm. So I went and did a little bit more exploring, and I realized that the power in that vacuum, that, shop, that not shop vac, but that um, shampooer, wasn't strong enough for the job that I needed to do. So guess what I had to do? I had to get on the phone. Well, I didn't do this. I got on the phone and I said, hey, by the way, do you think I can borrow your shop vac? Why? Because I needed more power. Because what I had wasn't sufficient to clear that drain. If you're going to go do a job for God, and he has called you to do something for him, he has deposited within you, it's time to stretch your borders. Don't you dare go borrowing power from somebody else. You get on your knees and you start seeking God and you draw on the power of the Holy Spirit and you call upon him and when you go to fall those trees and you go to cut down, you're going to have the cutting edge that you need. You're going to have all the with all power that you want because you went to the right source. Amen. You didn't go to some monkey hoover upright back. You went to a shop vac and you had 240 gallon power as opposed to a little 30 gallon power. And you were able to clear the drain because you called upon God. This is what we see happen to this young man. The other thing is, immediately once that ax head went f flying, he's like, alas, master, it was borrowed. 
that alas lets me know this guy cried out. He cried out because he lost his, lax, his axe head. He lost his ability to do what he needed to do. He couldn't fall any more trees. He couldn't continue the project that he set out on. His vision was great, but his resources were few. What he needed to do couldn't be accomplished because he didn't have all that was necessary. Alas, Master, it was borrowed. What have you lost today? What have you lost today? You lost hope? God, I'm this age. What have I accomplished with my life? Have you lost hope? What have you lost? Did you lose a job? A job you thought was the job to have? Did you lose a marriage? Fully intending that things would work out, but things just began to disintegrate year upon year. Have you lost a child? What have you lost? What are you searching for? What are you seeking for? What went flying behind you and became buried in a murky place and left you drained, left you on empty because you borrowed it? Crying out. People are crying out. Did not the father of the prodigal son go each day looking for when his son would come home? Some of us have lost family members. Some of us have lost our cutting edge. We no longer have that fortitude we once had. Some of us have lost our passion for God. Maybe we're disappointed in how things have turned out, how things are happening, and we've lost our desire. We've been rejected so many times, we feel like I can't make the cut anymore. I'm always overlooked. What have you lost? Think about it. Just pause in your heart before the Lord this morning. What have you lost? Have you lost your hunger for the word of God? Maybe your passions have weaned. You know what Paul said to the church of Galatians? Galatians 5. He said, you were running so well. Who cut in on you? Who obstructed your path? Who limited you from finishing this race? What came in your way? This fate, this journey is not for the weak. You were pursuing God. You were in the race. You were going for the prize of the high calling of Christ. What happened? What did you lose? Who cut in on you? Who hindered you? Who obstructed you? What prevented you from seeing the goal? Elisha turned to the young man and he says to him, where did it land? Guys, I know it's only like six, seven verses that we're looking at, but there's a few times where you have to pause when you're reading it and you're like, wait a second, the prophet asked. The prophet is supposed to know. So the prophet asked, where did it land? Do you think that Elisha asked because he didn't know where it landed? Do you think that he asked out of lack of knowledge, lack of understanding? No, rather, I think that we have to consider this thought. Sometimes God calls us to that place of, remember this incident? That's what cut in on. It was there that you lost it. It was there that you left it by the wayside. It was when they said that to you 
that you let it all go. It was when this happened, he let it fly behind you. It wasn't that Elisha needed to be shown where it was, but rather the student needed to recognize what he lost, where it was lost. Because how could he learn? How could we learn that we have operated on borrowed power if we haven't seen what we have lost? How can we recognize our cutting edge has been gone from us? If we don't realize when we reached for it, it's no longer there. Do you see what you've lost? Do you know where it is? Show me. Well, it was here when I was 10 years old. And since then, I've never been able to look at myself again. Well, it was when I was uh, in for review and the uh, corporate HR department was telling me that, uh, you know, my sales weren't the way they should have been. Well, you know, it was uh, this time when me and this other person, maybe a wife, maybe a friend, were fighting, and that was it. Recall to where it is. Why do we have to recall? Not because we want to stir up bad memories or bad feelings. Because there's a greater power that comes. You see, with that, Elisha takes a a branch. (laughs) Here's another thing we found. And um, he cuts it. Did you guys see that part of the verse? He cuts it. This dude's axe was not the only cutting edge in the group. There was another cutting edge there. Because Elijah was able to call upon it to use it in in the time of need. And he was able to cut the branch. But you see, here's the important thing that you need to realize. In a congregation of however many people are here today, you are important. It was important for Elisha to stop and locate that axe head for that young man because the work of God that needed to be done in and through his life needed to be called forth, needed to be called back, needed to be restored. And so Elisha was willing to stop and God is willing to stop today to hover over your life so that your future can be restored. So that the power that raised Christ from the dead can be restored to its rightful place within your life. God is about stopping the traffic for your sake. So don't think that you're just a nobody here today. You are an axe head that is about to float. You might be weighted down. Weighted down. No, really weighted down. Iron does not float, ladies and gentlemen. Iron does not float. This iron consisted of weight. Some of us today couldn't engage in worship because we are weighted down. Some of us came on just one more hope. Today... I'm going to find my freedom. I'm going to find my axe head. I'm going to relocate that which God deposited within me. I'm going to be like the barren woman and I'm going to sing. And I'm going to shout. Let's go back to that. Remember where we started, Isaiah 54? Turn right. Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. You you who have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who married, says the Lord. Here we go. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. 
Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left. And your offspring will possess the nations. You know what? Some of you have to be that barren woman and sing. Some of you have allowed that axe head to sit at the bottom of the Jordan River in those dirty waters way too long. And it's time for you to sing because you're not doing all that God has deposited within you to do. You're not accomplishing the word of God, that, the work of God that he has intended for you to accomplish. And that doesn't mean be getting behind a pulpit or getting behind a mic and singing or getting behind an instrument, although it could mean those things, but it means that you are meant to plant where you you have been deposited. You are meant to bloom and bring forth the ministry and the work of God wherever you have been deposited. And somehow we have listened to the lie of the axe head and said, iron doesn't flow. No, it doesn't. But when it meets up with the power of God, it has no choice but to flow because he is the God of the impossible. He is the God of the almighty works that no man can perform. Elisha takes the, st the stick and he cuts it <laughs> and he puts it in the water right where the young man said the ax should be. This body of water was not unfamiliar to Elisha. He knew that Joshua, as we said, crossed over after he succeeded Moses. He knew that he and his preceptor, Elijah, crossed over this Jordan on dry ground because they stretched forth the mantle. So Elisha was not held back by what he could not see. Do you think Elisha saw the ax head in the water? He did not see the ax head in the water. But he recalled to his mind the times of which he saw the power of God working and operating in that water. And he could cry out, God of Elijah, just as you caused my father Elijah to cross over this water, on dry ground, I'm believing you. I believe with all of my heart that though the scripture does not show us that Elisha prayed that, it was stirring within him. It was stirring within him. Recall to your mind the works of God. Remember David? When he was all downcast, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Look to the Lord, you will sing again. I remember when I used to lead the procession to the church. And we would worship God. That's just the modern vernacular of that psalm. I remember when I used to lead the procession. Come on, guys, let's go. We're going to worship Jesus. Do you think that Elisha, when he had that stick, he was just going, oh, God, I hope, I hope, God, I hope. No, he was recalling in his mind, and I'm sure that within his heart and with every core of his being, he was stirring up the remembrance of when God had been faithful. And he was believing that my God, who was faithful, will be faithful once again. And so he stretched it forth. Boop, I could hear the bubble. Bloop. And that crazy axe head, it just done stirred us all crazy because it floated to the top. It floated. It floated. Some people said it swam. No, it floated. If the Bible says it floated, it floated. Don't switch it up around. It floated to the top. And do you know what Elisha said? Reach for it and grab it. Pick it up for yourself. I love that Elisha's sister did not say, here, there's your axe head. He said, there it is. Pick it up. Pick it up. Pick it up. 
pick it up. God is saying to you today, there it is, pick it up. Pick it up. My power's there, reach for it. My intervention is there, reach for it. I have risen from the dark place, reach for it. You see, there's a little bit more that we can think about in that stick. Fast forward a few thousand years. Nah, fast forward a few hundred years. And what did we see? We saw Jesus who came because there was a world that was lost in a dark place. There was a world that was crying out, Master, I'm on borrowed time. God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God, I'm on borrowed time. I've lost my strength. I've lost my power. I've lost all that is within me. All my belief in knowing of who you are, I've lost it. I've given up hope. And God heard those cries. And he sent forth his son. And that son died on a, cro on a cross, died upon a tree. When he died upon a tree, he was buried in a tomb. You see, dead bodies don't rise. I've been to a few funerals. In fact, you know, I've lifted the body off the bed, I've put it on the gurney, covered it with a sheet, and brought it down to the refrigerator in the lower part of the hospital. I know that they don't rise. A matter of fact, they're not any help. They're heavy, they're weighty, and they're not easy to move. Dead bodies don't rise. You're not easily moved. Heard this sermon before. Been there, done that. Unless God comes through, I'm not going to believe it. Ever, ha ever met that mindset? But that Jesus went into the tomb, a borrowed tomb. A borrowed tomb. God says, you operate on borrowed power, but I'm going to show what my power does when it borrows a tomb. Because I don't need no tomb. I don't need any dark cave to hold me down. Because I'm greater. And so Jesus, who was buried in that tomb, rose again three days later. That ex axe head floated, not because of any power of Elisha. Though the mantle was upon him, he cried out to Elijah that he would have a double anointing. Though the mantle was upon him, that axe head floated because of the God of the impossible. The God of the impossible. Where's your axe head at today? Where's it at? Some of you know, but you just don't want to go to that memory. Because it hurts too much. It's okay. God is big enough to handle that hurt, heal it, and make you never the same. Where's the axe head at? There's an Elisha, and he heard his student crying out. The master heard the student say, Master, it was borrowed, and now I've lost it. There is a Jesus, and he has heard your cry. And he has said that nothing is too difficult for me. With man, this is difficult. But with me, all things are possible. All things are possible. There's a double message for us today. One message could be for us corporately. The place in which you dwell is too small. You're limited. It's time to stretch forth your tent pegs. It's time to break down some walls. It's time to believe what you cannot see. 
it's time to believe God for the greater vision, the greater scope of what he wants to do in this house. And when you think, nah, just remember, you're hindering future students as you hold to one place. God is not about making anything a monument. It's not about making any monuments. It's about raising his glory in a place. The other message, what have you lost? What do you need to regain? Reach out, grab that ax head. Because when you touch something that was impossible, you become empowered by the possible. Do you get that? If iron cannot float, but the power of God within it causes it to float, and you reach out and you tap into that power, the possible begins to take place within your life. The possible. Things that don't make sense, because they weren't made, meant to make sense by God's agenda. They were meant to declare that only God could do the impossible. See, some theologians want to say, oh, Elijah stuck his, uh, his stick in there and it just so happened to go into the open hole and he was able to cause that axe head to flow. No, because then it would have been Elijah who made that axe head float. But it was God. So our corporate message, Logos, stretch forth your tent pegs. Fasten them. Your place needs to be stretched. Your dwelling has limited you. Get those ten pegs and stretch them out. Your personal message, pick up your iron. Pick up your vision. Revisit what God deposited within you. And don't let any man have power over what God deposited within you. As long as you stay in that Jordan bed, you've given man power over you to keep you stifled and to keep you homebound. But God has called you out of that. Just as he called his son out of the cave, out of the tomb. He called his son out of the tomb and his son rose to resurrection life. He is calling you today out. He can do the impossible in your life when it looks like it's not possible. He can do the impossible in this church when it looks like it's not possible. It's time to sing. It's time to sing. You've been barren long enough. It's time to sing. It's time to sing. Stretch forth your tent pegs, stretch forth your arms, and start to sing. Start to declare. Your praise is ever on my lips. <laughs> you know what song came to my mind as I was doing the final notes? He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. He put a song in my star today, a song of praise. Hallelujah. Do you have a song of praise today? Have you been brought out of that miry place? Or is your axe head still there? I'm going to call Josh to come forward with the praise team. And I'm going to ask you today to make a step of faith. I'm going to ask you to look at the twofold message, the message that goes forth corporately to the body of Logos as we continue to believe God to lead us and direct us in what he would want to do with this church congregation and I would ask you to reflect on your own life you see we go forward and in vision and in power and in might when we're unified together but let's not pull the group behind because we're on a borrowed axe so the altar is open and I invite you to come I invite you to come for yourself and to seek God for yourself. And I invite you to come for the church of Logos.
to seek God for his plans for the church of Logos as we have been doing and to believe and if there's an axe head that God is showing you today reach out grab it and believe for him to do the impossible in your life Father God I just entrust your word to you Holy Spirit, I just ask that right now you would speak deep into the very hearts of your people. Lord, they heard your word, and I ask that your word would penetrate their hearts. Even for those that would be stoic in their place today, would they be moved by your Holy Spirit? Have your way in our house this morning, God. As we sing to you, God, have your way. Jesus, we pray. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. How many here would need prayer? Today you located an axe head and you need God to just come you need to trust in the impossible today you've been trying to believe you've been trying to hope but you have lost hope deferred hope makes the heart has a name. That name is Jesus. We have elders and deacons that can pray for you. But you need to reach out. Reaching out today might be coming to the altar. So you could lay hold of that and have a brother or a sister pray in agreement with you. But do not leave this place today without confronting that sunken axe head. You were called here today so that you could break forth and sing so that your barren places could begin to bring forth trees of righteousness once again. You didn't just come here for church. You had appointment today don't neglect seeing your physician come and respond and let Dr. Jesus do the impossible in your life you sing 